Um, going to the next question, um, or do you want to take that next one as well? Sure. So the next question is going to be, what is the most prevalent misconception about Israel that you're finding among U.S. college students? And I think we can all kind of take a different swing at that because there are a lot of misconceptions. And so whichever ones we think are most predominant, I think there's a pretty dominant idea that Jews are white Europeans, that like the Ashkenazi Jewish mold is the only type of Judaism there is. And that really contributes to this idea that um, like you can't be racist towards Jews, that you can uh, exclude Jews from other like kind of minority kind of events. Um, that oppression is like the natural course of a, any dynamic, like especially when you're talking about Israel, it becomes a very like white versus non-white, uh, white versus people of color, like these kinds of simple, like just diametrically opposed ideas um, are really corrosive in a lot of different ways, mostly in that alliance building and that if people don't know a lot about it. They can, you know, take the dynamic of, you know, any colonizing people and say, okay, well, the Israelis are just like, you know, the British and Palestinians are just like the Native Americans. And it's a really quick analogy that I find is like actually very difficult to root because uh, I would say most of the Jews that people on college campuses meet are going to look white. And so it takes a lot to deconstruct that because you have to go through, it seems like you have to go through quite a lot of history. Um, there's like the quick end way I do it. If, like somebody really is not engaged, doesn't have a lot of time. I say, like, you can't be white if you can't be a white supremacist. And Jews are not allowed to be white supremacists, obviously. So I think there's the, the easy answer. And then there's the, the more complex answer where you start talking about what, you know, ethno religions even are and how they were created so much earlier than all of these other constructs. That's, I think, the thing that I find uh, most prevalent in terms of myths. Um, anyone else want to take a swing? Yes, or please. So from my experience, the three main arguments I hear from the Palestinian solidarity movement really come to three groups, right? Which is apartheid, occupation, and excessive force, right? This is, if you can you go to the apartheid walls or if you go to the BDS meetings, that's really what you hear, occupation, 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 apartheid, and excessive force. Now, when I teach students how to communicate effectively for Israel, Right. If I go back and forth about a negative, it doesn't matter what my argument is. Right. The student has no idea what Israel is. The 70 percent has a negative emotion. So when you hear occupation, what I want the students to speak about instead is about peace. What steps Israel does to achieve peace when it comes to apartheid. Right. Israel is a racist country. What I want the students to speak about is a minority rights. Right. How they're protecting Israel, the Israeli Supreme Court. You go to the hospital. Right. You see the Arab is working side by side. You go to the Jerusalem, you see right the Temple Mount, the Church of Ho the Church of Holy Sepulchre, the Western Wall where freedom of worship is protected. And lastly, apartheid, I mean excessive force, right? That Israel are baby killers or whatever. And what I speak about is what Israel does to protect civilian lives, right? Whether it's knocking on the roof or jumping the leaflets or calling ahead or making sure there's no civilians, right? Before that. So we, those are the three misconceptions I hear, occupation, apartheid, excessive force. And every time I hear that, what I want to do is change that conversation to something positive. Because like I said, mentioned earlier, it doesn't matter what I say, right? What matters is how I make people feel. So I want the conversation to be positive so that when they walk away, they walk away with a smile. Thanks, Nadav. Thank you so much. Um, I will also give a chance, Marlene, would you like to um, Take a stab at one of the questions and just maybe read it out to everyone before answering, just because. Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we got one question and I'm just going to summarize it, but it asked about, um, I mentioned apartheid week. So it asked about um, doing something similar on the Israeli side of ZOA. ZOA campus would be interested in like a Palestinian apartheid week. And another question similarly about like the apartheid wall being brought to campus and uh, how students respond with like putting up their own like makeshift bomb shelters and other responses and how ZOA, um, if we see these as successful. Um, I think the most important thing when we're addressing about like what does ZOA do and what does ZOA campus do in my view is really, again, it's really not about what 
we as individuals want. I can have all my opinions about what students are doing, what professionals are doing, but we have to be respectful that the, this is the campus of the students. And the reality is in terms of campus dynamics, in terms of campus politics, in terms of the administration, that student, that professional on the campus is the expert. There's always gonna be some underlying connotation, some underlying personal relationships that we can't know the depth of because we're not there day to day. So what we as professionals have to be cautious of is we can't go into their campus and make a mess because then they're the ones that clean it up, right? So if a student wants to do, for example, Columbia has a very successful Hebrew Liberation Week, which is their response to Israeli Apartheid Week. That's successful. ZOA supports it. I have a ZOA fellow on that campus that, I mean, it was canceled because of the fact that the campus is closed, but in past years, the ZOA fellow on that campus was extremely active in that movement. ZOA definitely supported it. So if that comes from the students, and we're always welcome to give ideas, right? We can empower the students in whatever ways we see fit. Um, so we're always happy to give ideas about, okay, this is how you can battle apartheid, the apartheid argument to say you can battle the apartheid wall, this is how you can battle Israeli apartheid week. Um, we're always welcome to give suggestions, help them plan, help get them resources, speakers, things for events, things to make those things to make those walls, but we can't, if the students feel that that's inappropriate for their campus, it would be extremely detrimental for us to come in and just take over and do it anyway. So I really just wanna emphasize um, to everyone who's out there looking to be an ally to campus to make sure you're always, if you have ideas, if you wanna talk to students, if you wanna help them, just make sure you are getting them involved, make sure you're listening to what they're saying the problems are because every single campus is unique. And so there is no, so while we hear, oh, like Israeli apartheid week, every Israeli apartheid week on every campus is different. And so every single solution has to be different. Um, and every single program that we do has to be tailored to that campus. It's not just about, oh, well, we're gonna do a Palestinian apartheid week and that's the one size fits all solution um, because there's so much campus politics to take into, into consideration. Thanks so much, Marlene. Um, ben, do you wanna have a chance to tackle one last question before we wrap it up? If not, um, yeah. I have a question here too, I don't mind. Yes, definitely. Actually, I had, I had a conversation with one of my students from a university that uh, is in my region of North Carolina. I just spoke to them today and got some more information about it. So the question is, I'm, I have a separate screen over here, so I'm going to look and read. Let's see. Sorry, give me just a second. Yeah, so how have you, you slash ZOA been leveraging recent Title VI upgrades to gain greater compliance and sensitivity from universities, I guess, for, uh, from the anti-Israel slash anti-Semitic activities on certain campus groups, faculty members, and even publishing arms. So the, in regards to this, at Duke University about a year ago, towards the end of the semester, they had a, it was a really anti-Semitic conference in general, and they had a very anti-Semitic rap song that was played at the conference. And the students actually came to the ZOA, specifically to Susan Tuchman, who is our director for our Center for Law and Justice. And she helped to file a Title VI violation or Title VI violation complaint with the university. We actually won that. And the, if I'm not mistaken, the federal government actually stepped in. And with the new laws that were passed, actually came to a resolution with Duke University and UNC Chapel Hill to basically follow certain steps to train their teacher. They had a bunch of different tenets to the resolution that they had. And recently, they, what we, from what we know, Duke has since violated that. And what we're going and doing is we're, we're following up and we're holding these universities accountable. And so that's the biggest thing that we can do in situations like this and really supporting our students. For my, for my level, I support my students, letting them know I'm here for them if they want to discuss anything, they want to talk. I'm here 100% for them, and really using Susan as the best medium with our as our direct set, our set director for our Center for Law and Justice. That's really how we're using this these new policies that have been enacted to our advantage, and she's the best person to go to that. Uh, Jonathan and Or, if you guys want to touch on uh, any any other specifics for maybe universities that you've dealt with. Sure. Then um, just for the sake of time, um, I, I, we will wrap it up very soon. And I want to just tell everyone, um, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for all the questions. I know there are uh, quite a few that we didn't get to answer, but please, we encourage you to connect with us um, on social media, on Facebook. Please visit also zoacampus.org and also 
find us on our Facebook page and connect with us. We'll be happy to, to talk more and answer more of those questions. And um, as you heard from all of our staff just now, we're really involved in so many different facets of pro Israel advocacy and standing up to anti-Semitism. And what Ben just mentioned also about working in partnership with Susan Tuckman at the Center for Law and Justice, um, that is such an integral part of the work that we're doing um, and having the support um, of the government to really defend Jewish students in such hostile atmospheres, it means a lot. We do not take it for granted. Um, and I think that really is something that should really cross all partisan lines. And just to emphasize again, you know, we're, we're here to present a unified message about Zionism. It's not political. We're not here um, to speak one specific message. Um, for students who are there, who are willing to stand up for Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state and stand up for Israel uh, to, and the Jewish people to have the opportunity to live in peace and security, that is our mission. And when it comes to standing up against the type of lies and how anti-Semitism is often kind of when we hear, for example, members of If Out Now trying to separate anti-Semitism from anti-Zionism, we understand that that's falsely um, untrue. If you're going to deny the right of Jews and only Jews, um, self-determination, that's fundamentally anti-Semitic, and we're always going to stand up for our right um, to live in peace and security. So thank you so much, everyone. Please stay uh, connected with us. We're, we're here. We're happy to answer more of your questions, and please stay safe, and thank you again. Also, just want to say we're going to have some upcoming webinars. So specifically, we talked a lot about the work that the Center for Law and Justice does. So we'll be announcing that. So follow the Zionist Organization of America on Facebook or anywhere else, and you'll be able to hear when that's coming up. And I'm sure we'll be doing more of these in the future as we make this transition.